Good morning. Good morning. This is January 28th, the year 2003, and we're in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. We're privileged to have with us today Frank Schiffries. Frank, good morning. How are you feeling on this very, very cold morning? May I ask you when you were born? 11, 13, 19. November 13th, 1990. Okay, and where were you born? Boston. And your current address? Chestnut Hill, Brookline. Marital status? Uh, my wife passed away three years ago. I'm sorry, and you have uh, children? I've got two boys. And one of them is here with you today? Yes, I understand. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? In the, <coughs> the Army base in Boston in 1942. January, I think it was the 13th. Of 1942? Yeah. So that's just a few weeks after Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Um, did you join the armed forces because of Pearl Harbor? You know, way yeah. <clears throat> and when you joined, did you join with um, other people that what, from school? Uh, another friend? Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us about uh, going into the armed forces. You signed up. Did you go to a recruiting office in Boston? Yeah. And uh, why did you choose the Army? <coughs> well, <coughs> I like the Army. I like the Air Force. That's what I like. Said I want to apply. <coughs> so that's I choose the Air Force to go into. So you enlisted in the yeah. Air Force. Yeah. Okay. Um, in '42, January of '42. And where were you sent for basic training? Or where Jefferson you... Barracks in uh, Missouri. Jefferson, Missouri. Is, was that basic training? Yeah. You learned to walk, march around yeah, and so. uh, things like that. Yeah. That's unusual for uh, people from Boston to have been sent out there. Oh, yeah. Was there any particular reason for that? No, everybody that was with me is all in here. You all went out to Missouri. Yeah. Had you ever been out far away from home before? No, not before. So you got on a train and took off to Missouri. Yeah. How long were you out there? Let's see. Well, that three months we had to stay there at Jefferson Barracks training. Was it cold or was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had a plenty of snow. Did you march around and learn no. all sort of drilling, things like that? A little bit, not much. They didn't bother us. Were you issued any weapons to uh, no. learn? No? No weapons. Where, did you go to any particular schools there at Jefferson Park? I went to a, a, the gunnery school, and I went to the radio operator school. That was in Florida, Tindlefield, oh, Madison, Wisconsin. I went to radios. Okay, but from Jefferson Barracks, did you? From there, we went to Salt Lake City okay. for assignment. At Jefferson Barracks, yeah. uh, did you take a series of tests or something like that to determine what the Air Force would do, you know, what slots you would get in the Air Force? No. Okay, so uh, from Jefferson Barracks, where were you sent? To Salt Lake City. And what did you Utah. do? What did you do there? To, we just stayed there to get a sign where, which base we would go. What is the name of the base in Utah? It's up north of Salt Lake there. All I know is Salt. We went to Salt Lake City. I don't know yeah. where the base. It's still it's there. It's the still there, yeah. And, uh, and okay, you're on a new base, you're in Utah. And you've been in the Air Force three months now. Yeah. D did they give you any tests or okay. things? Okay. <coughs> How did you wind up being a gunner? Uh, well, at first I became a radio operator, and then I went to gunnery school. <coughs> I decided we had to go to gunnery school to train, because every one of us has a gun on the airport in different positions. So, in other words, no matter what you did on the plane, you knew you had to learn how to shoot yeah. machine guns. Yeah. 
So you went to radio school first? Yeah. And where was that? Madison, Wisconsin. All right. Tell us, tell us about that. Uh, you must have had some skills for them to decide that you could do this. Yeah. What did they teach you, and, and how, how did you code. learn it? I had to take more scores. They had to take 16 words a minute to pass. And I did over 16, but after we learned, you know, the Morse code. And I passed it, and then from there I went to gunnery school. In radio school, yeah. we're talking about something 60-some years ago now. Oh, yeah. it's, it's quite a way back there. Why were you learning Morse code? In, in, did airplanes communicate with each other using Morse code? Oh, yeah. The radio operators, on the missions, we only listen to Morse code. We can't send anything. Okay, so somebody on the ground is communicating with you via Morse code. Yeah. Uh, what kind of, well, that's what we're getting ahead of ourselves. You learn Morse code. What else did you learn? How to fix radios, take oh. them apart and put them back together? No. Who maintained your radio when you were in the uh, service? The yeah, service? When I was flying? Yeah, who took care of the radio? Well, I, I was the radio operator, but there was nobody else that took care of the radio. Okay. If we lose contact, we just keep up with the group. What did you like about that school, or what did you dislike it? No, it was right, it was right in the main town, the radio school. It was right in the town, the city. Madison, I think it's the capital. Yes, it? that's correct. Yeah. It was nice, all college girls around there. And beach. <laughs> One of the pleasures, yeah. How long were you in that school? Do you remember, Frank? Yeah, 16 weeks. That would be four months. Okay, so we're coming up to the summer of 42 then. You were sent out to Utah for, for, for gunnery school. No, gunnery school was in Florida. Okay, what, what did you do in Utah? You were in waiting Utah, to be sent to somewhere? Assigned. You were just be waiting for assignment? Yeah. Okay, from there they sent you to Florida? No, from there I went to <coughs> El Paso, Texas. I've been all over. <laughs> El Paso, Texas. Right. That's where they signed us to a group. And <coughs> I took another test and I passed. I had to go to radio school. In El Paso, Texas, had you already been to radio school then? No. Well, no. yes and no. First I wasn't, and then I was. You know, at the radio school. Okay. So you're an expert now on radios. <laughs> Not now, it's too long, I forget everything. Well, I meant then, uh, the Air Force okay. thought you were good enough to send yeah. you up in a plane. And then, how come you became a gunner? Because everybody had two jobs, is that it? Except for the pilots? And, and where was the, uh, that school, in Florida somewhere? Yeah, Panama City. Panama, Panama, Panama City. City, Florida. Tell us about going to gunnery school. <coughs> well, you keep, most of them shoot the guns. They take different targets and all that. We you practice. You don't have to take a test except to they take you up in the plane and you fire, shoot at it, <coughs> not the bit they have, stick it out, <coughs> and see how your score is. If you do good, you pass. Were you shooting at a sleeve being towed by another plane? Yeah. yeah. What was the other plane, do you remember? Just a, like the, the plane we went on. What, what color was it? Bright yellow? I didn't, <coughs> I didn't know it was. It's, I, it, it's, it's <coughs> doesn't gray, make, yeah. Yeah. gray one, the gray, usually. And what kind of plane were you in? Uh, <coughs> same kind of plane that the, we shot at. They just took us up and it was like we didn't even know what plane we were in. They did it so fast. Okay. Were, um, were you assigned to a bomber squadron yet? No, not yet. Okay. So you weren't necessarily flying in bombers at this time. Mm -hmm. And you were shooting at other planes and evidently you were pretty good because you so. became a gunner. Yeah. Did you shoot also at targets on the ground yeah, as you went yeah, over them? Yeah. And, and that other, uh, 
Tarkus. We were, they took us in the room, and they had <coughs> on a wheel that we sat at chairs, and it would go around, and we'd have to watch for a target and shoot. See how good we did. And you did well. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> did you learn at this time, or, or have any training in aircraft identification, so you shoot the right guys down? Yeah. They, they tell us the German planes. And me 109, that's Messerschmitt 109, and a few of our others. And how did they show you? Did they show you slides going by? And no, on the screen. Yeah. The yeah. Plane going by. On and the so screen. you'd have to identify the plane and say, yes, no, yeah. yeah. I'll shoot at that one, but not at the next one, which is a P 47 or something. Yeah, it was everywhere. Okay. About how long were you in Florida? It's, that was. And that was a lot, about five weeks. But gunnery school, that's not long. Five weeks? No. And did you learn how to take apart and oh, yeah. put your, uh, together your guns? And all that. Were, you, it. were you shooting 30s or 50s? You probably were using 50 calibers. 50 calories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. While you were there, were we, were you with people that you knew from other outfits? No. So you're pretty much on a, a, yeah, alone yeah. again. What was your first duty after you left Florida then? <coughs> they shipped me to uh, El Paso, Texas. That's where I met my group on the, on the plane, to go on the plane. We flew together always. Tell us about that, Frank, because this is the group, theoretically, you're going to be with through the rest of the, the, rest of the war. Um, there's a big field there, and it's... Um, is this where the, the, you first were introduced to your bombers? Yeah. So is, is this the first time you'd seen B-17s? Oh, yeah. What did you think about those? Oh, I, loved <coughs> I trained on two planes, B-24 and a B-17. <clears throat> and when I was sent overseas, I was on a B-24. When I got to Italy, they put me on a B-17. There's a lot of discussion long after the fact about those two planes. Which did you prefer? Which did you think it was the better plane? B-17. That's what they all say. Oh, sure. Yeah. We call it the Flying Fortress. Why did you think it was the best plane? It felt so smooth when you fly in it. Then we had turrets all over the plane, in the back, underneath, the bimmer, we called it, in the top, in the front, side. It was really quick with the guns. We had fun with them. This is 1942. Did you have a chin turret at that time? No. They, had, they hadn't gotten on the planes yeah. yet. So did you train to be in a particular place, for example, if you were going to be the ball gunner down below, did you train the same way as though you were going to be the tail gunner? Oh, yeah. Same, same training. Yeah. And what was your assignment? Or each time you got in the plane, did you take a different gun or the no, same gun? Same gun. Same gun all the time. Gun. What was your position? Waist gunner. Waist gunner. Yeah. Okay. I was facing that way. I was on the right one. And after a while, my understanding is that they learned that they didn't need gunners on both sides, depending on where the plane was going to be in the formation. Did you always go up with two gunners? Oh, yeah. Okay. And how long did you uh, train in a B-17 then to when get I used got, to that plane? I was shot down on my 19th mission. <coughs> I'm the lucky one. My whole crew was at the Isle of Capri for a vacation. Okay, well, we're, we're skipping ahead. Just hang on a second here. When you went up in the B-17s at first in Texas to learn, did you go in groups as though flying in formation? And did you get used to close... Uh, 
close in contact of other planes? No, but not too close. You know, yeah. But we went up with another group, so. Now, did you go up as a gunner or a radio man? Radio. And a gunner. And so you were not manning your gun until you got in to where there was something yeah, to shoot right. at. That's right. You're on your radio, and right. then you get in a combat zone. That's you right. go back and man your gun. Yeah. All right. Tell us about leaving Texas, leaving the States, and how you got overseas. Okay. When we left uh, El Paso, we, <coughs> and we went to Norfolk, Virginia, and from there we took a boat, because there were no planes for us here. We took a boat over to Africa, and I stayed in Africa for a month. The whole, you know, everybody stayed in Africa, and Oran. Oran, you were at Oran. Yeah, Oran. A lot of, lot of activity there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And were you stationed at an airfield there? Or? No. No, you were in, just in barracks. Yeah, waiting. Yeah. What about your training while you're sitting around for a month? What did they do with you? Nothing. Nothing. You just had time off? Yeah, time off. <laughs> you were lucky. I had a friend of mine that was stationed in the same place, but further away, and I went to visit him for one day. I stayed over in the barracks. So you got to see somebody you knew? Yeah. Were, had you been assigned to a unit? Could you tell us then? Uh, Not yet. Okay. So you were in a, um, a barracks of people waiting to be assigned right. to a particular unit. We, we were supposed to go to China. But the, in Italy, a whole crew group got shot down, and we had to take their place. At this point, um, did you have feelings about what kind of an outfit you wanted to be in? You say you like the B-17. Oh, you mean the plane, yeah. No. Did you have choices of doing no. any uh, uh -huh. anything else with your radio skills? No. No. So it was either B-17s or B-24s. Yeah. Were you ever it could offered be, be 25 even? Were you were yeah. offered lighter bombers, 25s, 26s? No. B17, B24. That that was it. Just the heavy bombers. Yeah. Which of all the things that you might have gone into was your hope that you would be assigned to the 17s? Oh yeah. So you really liked that oh, yeah. plane. All right. You're in Africa. It's getting to be the end, close to the end of 42. Um, were you involved at all in the invasion of North Africa? No. Okay, where did you go from Oran then? We went to uh, Italy, Foggia. Foggia. By boat. They didn't send you around much in an airplane, did they? Not by boat. We stopped off in Sicily for one day. You pulled into Palermo or? No. Uh, Catania. Catania. That's where we stayed yeah. overnight. <clears throat> then took the, the boat and go, went to. You're in Foggia now? Hmm? You go, went to Foggio. Yeah. And um, can you tell us what was there? What did you see when you got to tents. this? <laughs> tents. Uh, yeah, a lot. Of, we saw, that's where we lived in tents. And it was like a uh, farm, big open space. And that's all we did. When we weren't flying, we dressed. When you know where to go. When you got there, yeah. were you assigned to an outfit then? Would you tell us the name and number of that outfit? Yeah, the uh, 341st Squadron and 97th Group. Were you with them until the end of the war? Oh, yeah. Or until you? had your yeah. great misfortune, which we're going to get to in a minute. When you got to Foggia, was this an active base where bombers operating out of there? Where were they going? What were your targets? <laughs> My targets, we used to go to Yugoslavia. We, lived, we never went to Germany. We were in the 15th Air Force. Germany, they were in the 8th Air Force from England. And we bombed all Adriatic. <coughs> All those countries from uh, near the end of the Arabic Sea. Let's remember something here. Now go back until your very first combat mission. 
you climb up into the plane, you get into your position, it takes off. Tell us how you felt about that. We went to Cologne, France. That's where we, our first mission was. And <coughs> it was 50 degrees below zero. We had to keep our hands on the gun to keep it a little warm. We were cold. Cologne, France. That's the walks and all that, where they had the U-boats. And that's where we bought the first mission. After that, I said, oh, it was cold. Did you, uh, were, you were you attacked at all from the ground or other airplanes on that mission? that mission? So you felt pretty good about that mission? Oh, sure. And during bombing, as a, as a waste gunner, uh, you feel the bombs leave the plane. I can see them. Yeah. Can you look down and tell us what you see? Can you see the results of the bombing? No. Or does the plane turn and no. you're, you're gone? No, we kept going and then just kept going. We see puffs of smoke on the ground, but we don't know if it was our bomb or another one because we were so close. Yeah. Prior to leaving, you went through a briefing. <coughs> this is, is going to be your target for today. Oh, yeah. Five in the morning, we used to go for the And you're sitting there on your first mission, and you were, you're saying you're going up to bomb submarine pens or whatever they were that day. Can you remember your feelings about, uh, I'm trying to figure how old you were at that time. Um, not very old, and you're off in okay. combat. What's the feeling being up there in a plane? And you're cold, it's 50 below, and you're... You're all hooked in, wearing your gear, heavy gloves, and all yeah. of this. And then you you bomb, right. and, you, the and then you go home. Oh, yeah. You must have felt great. Sure. Felt great. That's what made me. How much time did you have before you had to go up again? Next day, two days. <laughs> you don't get much, because it's, you know, one field and everybody goes up. What did you and your crew and the guys in the barracks talk about while you're waiting? You've been on one flight now and after a while you get up to 15, 16. What, what did you talk about? Home, about our friends, <coughs> and well, most of the time we read, read a book or whatever in the tents that we were in. Did any and sort, just, just excuse around. me, did any sort of training continue while you were there in combat? Did no you training. go out and brush up on your skills as a gunner, anything no, like no that? No training. We just went on the missions, came back, rested till the next day or the next two days, whatever they scheduled us. The war is going on, and how did you hear about what was happening in other units or in the rest of Europe? Well, what somebody would hear it from the higher up, and it goes down, and they tell us about it, and we talk about it. Was there a lot of scuttlebutt rumors about uh, we're going to Germany or we're going to bomb something else? No, 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 no. You guys uh, took it as it came, yeah. and you'd go to your briefings and be told what's next. Um, when did you f first see? Uh, enemy aircraft in the sky? Well, <clears throat> the first two missions, we all, the same group went. My pilot had to turn back his stomach. So <clears throat> we had to come back, we didn't go on the mission. The second time, same thing with him. We had to come back, and they finally took him off the crew. And they sent him to France to fight a group. Tell us what you mean, stomach. He, was he afraid or? I don't know. He just. He couldn't, you know, he didn't know why, but he got sick. Yeah. He felt like throwing up every time. Why wouldn't the co pilot have taken over the flight? They hate to abort. I don't know. <coughs> the co pilot would have been able to fly it. It's our first couple of missions. Yeah, everybody was new. Yeah. 
in, in shakedowns like this where everybody's up there for the first time or the second time, it must have been a great learning experience for you. You, you, you found out the things that the, that the army never told you and you had to find it out by yourselves. Like don't shoot the tail off your own plane. <laughs> yeah. Some of the basics. The waist gunner is the only one that could actually hit the plane. The tail gunner can only shoot one way, you know, in the back. And the, the uh, ball turret could only shoot the <coughs> straight or down, could never hit the plane. We're the only ones, the waist gunner, can hit the plane. You could hit the wings, I take it. Yeah. Yeah. Or the tail. Let's, let's go back to something I asked you just a second ago, Frank, about seeing uh, enemy planes or anti-aircraft fire. Did you experience uh, hack hack while you were up there? <coughs> yeah, they, <coughs> they tried to break up the group because they fly right between us and they weren't shooting at us. They, they wanted to break us up so they could pick us off one at a time. That's when I first saw them. And they're going by you about 300 oh, miles an you, hour. So how do you draw a bead on a thing like that? How do you hit th something like that? We jumped, you know, the hatch. We get a little scared the first time you saw them. But we got over it, though. One of these things is coming at you with the formation. You've got like th three seconds. Oh, yeah. To hit this thing. I don't see them until they come in, in view of my waist gun. What we call playing at three o'clock, you know, just like a clock. Every play, two o'clock, playing at one o'clock, twelve o'clock is straight in front of the plane. So it was like a clock we called off. Playing at four, that's four o'clock. Seven, whatever you know, time. But we use it as a clock. And then you look and you see this thing coming. Yeah. How many flights did you make, Frank? 19. I was on my 19th flight. And I read in some of your background that uh, you went out one morning and 19 made you a veteran, that you've yeah. been up that many times. And you took a look at a kind of beat up old 17 sitting out there. And that was the first time that crew <clears throat> flew in it. With that a very green crew. To. First mission. And you had bad feelings, is that right? You felt, uh-oh. Yeah. Can you tell us about that day and, and where you went and what happened to you? Yeah. <clears throat> well, before that, I was in the hospital and it was for uh, 18 days. I had clinical malaria not the gin, symptoms of malaria. And I came out and my, they told me my crew went to, you know, it, <coughs> Sesame there or whatever, at the Isle of Capri. And I was supposed to go with them. I didn't want them because they were ahead of me on missions. I wanted to catch up so we could go home together. So I, had, I went to see the general there and I told them the whole story and all that, and that we stayed, and I caught up. But I went down on the 19th. They weren't back yet. When they came <clears throat> back, that's when they found out what happened. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're, you're flying on your 19th mission. Yeah. And what happened to you? Well, <clears throat> the plane could keep up with the rest. We were the tail end shouting. They called it. We were the, we were the last plane in the group because we couldn't keep up. The plane was just lucky that we get to the target. They, uh, Lady Luck was the name of it. Boy, what a misnomer. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and you're at the very end of the formation, which is not a good place to be. No. What, do you remember what your target was that day? Yeah, right. Balberry Factory in Austria. <coughs> Near Graz, Austria. This is May 24th, 1944. Right. And you were shot down. Yeah, flat. 
We weren't shot down. We were hit by guns from the ground, black. And then, <coughs> but Franks, what's yeah. what's it like to be in a plane, and suddenly you're hit? What what's the feeling? <laughs> the rest of the crew, when the pilot said bail out, because we were losing the altitude, he said bail out. The crew was a new crew. They were afraid to even look out. You know, we, we, they have a pulley like you pull and the door falls off. So I was in the radio room and I said, stay back and I went right out without looking. Because I you know, if you look, you get scared. I went right out and I, I looked up at the plane. I was away from it. I pulled my cord. And then they came out except the pilot. He went down with the plane. Did you have chest shoots? The oh, yeah. chest shoots that yeah. snapped on? Yeah. So you, you just grabbed it, snapped it on, and took off out the door. Yeah. Um, did, did you feel the plane get hit? No. We, you know, <coughs> we did a little run because the plane was going bad when, without getting hit. Yeah. So when it got hit, it was the engine in the front of the plane, one of the engines. That made it worse that we couldn't fly. So you went out the door, you were in a chute sailing down, and you look back up and see your plane, I, and you see the other chutes coming that's out. That's right. Were you counting them? Nine, yeah, sure. Nine of us. I counted, counted me, nine. And, and the so there's one missing. The plane he he stayed with the plane. He's going to be the last one. I was yeah. in the way. Did you see the plane hit the ground? No. Did you see it crash? No. no. You're drifting down over enemy territory, um, a, farm. a farm, and the and ground is coming up, huh? the ground is coming up, That's right. and what happened then, Frank? I was, I was light. I didn't weigh much, 105 pounds. I thought I was going up instead of down. Because <laughs> you, until you see the ground good, you're, pretty, you're down pretty good. Yeah. Did you land on the ground? Yeah, I'm between trees. I hit a tree, and uh, the branches went through. And they were the farmers were waiting for us with the guns. You're the looking. It's good. You're looking down, and suddenly there's a bunch of guys with guns waiting for you. Even women were there, but they didn't have guns. Well, uh, what happened then? Then they took us to the farmhouse. You say yes. Uh, who else? The rest of your crew. Yeah. Well, whichever they, was there, they I was there with two others. We landed in the same place. Yeah. The other ones, as we went out, then they went up further away. We <coughs> don't know what happened to them, but we saw them come out. <coughs> I know it's an odd question, uh, Frank, but uh, how did you feel at that particular? Were you afraid? No, I wasn't afraid. Did you think these people would kill you? No. When we landed, I gave my shoe to one of the girls because our shoes were silk. And they, you know, never had that. So I gave it to them. They made dresses out of them. But I wasn't scared or anything. But it's, isn't this kind of a bummer to be down on the ground and the rest of the formation is taking off? Uh, you, you just lost your whole family. That's right. If it was my regular crew, I, you know, would have thought different. But these, I never knew these people in the, the crew I went in. Did you know the names of any of the guys you flew with that day? I have it here. So you got, you got it after yeah. the fact? Okay. All right, where did they take you, these people on the ground? Yeah, they took, well, the, the soldiers came to the farm, and they took us, the soldiers, in the car. Now these are Austrians, right? Yeah. yeah. There was three of us. <clears throat> they took us to the airfield, the Graz airfield, G R A Z. And they put us down down the basement they had <coughs> like a cell with bars and they closed us in to uh, they shipped us out. I went to uh, Frankfurt. That's where they interrogate you. Interrogation by the Austrians for a prisoner of war. No, by German troops. Frankfurt, these are. Excuse me, that is correct. This was May 
24th. So you were within two weeks of D-Day. Uh, where did you first hear that the Europe had been invaded? <laughs> we had one fellow in all the compounds. We had four compounds for Americans. And one of them had a crystal set. And they were able to hide it every time the Germans had a chase out. And they got the word. And then they passed it around to everybody. Could you believe it? Your, your luck? No. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Invasion. Now tell us about the interrogation. Was that difficult for you? No, no. <laughs> the only thing is, you know, they had my dog tag. They took his chin on it. That's Jew. So he says, oh, you're Jew? I said, yeah. He said, oh, we had a lot of Jews here. I said, I know it. You had a lot of Jews. You're both using the past tense. Yeah. So did that make you more apprehensive that uh, you well, might be singled out? Was, uh, I didn't know what they were going to do with me. What did they do with you? Nothing. <laughs> we got jam sandwiches. That was our dinner, supper, or whatever. That's all we ever got. GM sandwiches? Well, I was only there a couple of days. And from there, we got on a plane, on a train, and went to the, <coughs> where we were, the prison camp. Was the treatment given to your fellow captives or others from other planes that you must have run into different for the other guys or for you? No. It was all the same, okay? You are on your way to a prison camp now, yeah. I take it. You were in Stalag Luft four. 4 for airmen. And you were an enlisted man, yeah. So you went into a camp that other were there were any officers? No, no, no. officers. <coughs> all the enlisted men <coughs> on the planes. It's all only the Air Force. Where was See, that's looked? Is Air Force? Where Where was this particular camp? Frank? In this Staten. Staten. Yeah, that's up in the Baltics, near the Baltic Sea. You're marched, you get off a train, and they dump you at a, at a, at a camp. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your feelings about going into a camp. The camp, I didn't mind. They had dogs as we were walking to the camp, and the uh, head of the group, not our group, the Germans, he kept sending the dogs after us. You know, the biters and all that. Great. I am lucky it never came to me. Here's a question. What what did you do in the camp? You were in there nine months, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, what did you do? What was a daily life nothing. like? Nothing. We, we went out, we used to go out and play ball. From the Red Cross, we used to get bats, balls. I got this from the Red Cross. And we used to <coughs> get a package of food every other week because it was rationed to us. I'm going to ask you about the book you're holding in your lap now, Frank. Uh, first of all, you got it because there was one book and a bunch of you and you cut cards yeah. and you got an ace. Right. Had you dealt the deck, Frank? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the book and can you uh, show us some of the pages yeah. and tell us about what's in it. This okay. is a log, <laughs> yeah, a there's journal. there's a lot of poems in it. Yeah. And drawings of the different planes. And <coughs> um, things like <coughs> want to be home, this loved ones, and all that. There are po a lot of poems in there. And the names, I made all the names of Massachusetts I have. Uh, well, they, the Germans had a shakedown every once in a while to find this book, but it was in there. I used to take it out with me. When they had the shades down, we all had to get out. And I used to take the book with me. So if the, the, if the Germans had found that it would have been confiscated, oh, sure. you were not allowed to keep material oh. like this? That's what they wanted. See what we put in it. This is a, a rare and wonderful book to have. Oh, yeah. um, do you go and look at it occasionally and share it with your family or other people? You mean now? When I came back with the family? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Have you ever had occasion to share it with guys who were in the camp with you? As I was going around, you know, to get the different fellas to put something in the book, yeah. they would see what I had, and then they do this. Have you ever uh, had any kind of a reunion where guys have, who contributed to this book no. have looked at it? No. <laughs> this was a wonderful thing to have, and I, I would suspect that it helped keep you going. When you say, you, I can imagine, there's nothing to do in camp, but wait till you get out of it. But to have this and uh, people writing poems and contributing to it, um, I congratulate you on having kept it this long. On the march that we were on, when they <coughs> evacuated camp, we had, <coughs> in February it was, they took us all out on the march, and we're going to eat <coughs> where the Americans were and the British, because the Russians were coming at us. And they were afraid to get caught by the Russians. The guards were afraid they didn't want to get caught by the Russians. I would imagine that you would rather have been picked up by the Americans than the, than the Russians. Oh, sure. How long was this March? And this is February in the worst winter that Europe had? Yeah, 60 days, two months we marched. <coughs> and we slept in the barns, our open fields. What did, what did you have to eat, Frank? Potatoes. Did any of the local populace feed you or give no. you food? <coughs> the only thing is some of the fellows swapped packs of cigarettes for bread or whatever they could get. We, <clears throat> we had, when we evacuated, they gave us each a parcel of red cloth to carry. You should see the food everybody was throwing away. We couldn't carry it anymore for marching. So I had my all loaded in my shirt, cigarettes. And that's what helped To me. swap for food along sure. the way. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I, I take it there was a lot of snow on the ground? Oh, yeah, ice, snow. Yeah. And you guys are sleeping in barns? Barns or open fields, if they couldn't get to a barn. While you were in the camp, you got parcels. Uh, were you able to get mail from home? Oh, yeah. But not for a while, but then we yeah. found a drop. And you were allowed one postcard or something to send yeah. out, that yeah. kind of thing? Two a month, I think. How often did you get mail call? Oh, but, well, they had mail call after we were there about three months. They had a mail call. That was the first one. Then after that, when the letters came in, they would come around to the barracks. And, 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 although the Germans looked at them first, and the Americans looked at them before that, you know, make sure we would say everything. Yeah. Was your camp situated so that you could see American planes flying over. One time, we saw near the end a raid going, yeah. going over, and you're at the same time. Did, did anybody have a radio in this camp? Just the one I told you. The same the one. Crystal set. So you were kind of aware of what was going on in the war. Yeah. You realized the the German pocket was shrinking smaller yeah. and smaller. Yeah. So you were counting the days, weren't you? Yeah. Let's get out of here. <clears throat> but once we got on the march, it wasn't too good. A lot of fellas couldn't but keep going with the march. They started running away, and the guys would run after them, and all we would hear was pop, pop. So we didn't know what happened. If you tried to run away, they killed you? Oh, sure. Yeah. So you had tough decisions to make as to I whether... I never thought of running away until near the end. Yeah. What happened at the end? What? How were you found? <coughs> When they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were taking us towards uh, France, Belgium, and <coughs> over the Red Elk River, we went, and then they got lowered us, I guess, to take us back because the push was coming on from the British and the Americans, so we started to go back from the, where we came from, half, you know, that's when over the bridge we started to take off, the three of us and, and two other fellows. We ran in bushes, in the trees, 
and the guys were taken off too. They didn't want to get caught. That's a good point. Um, at this point, the German guards must have begun thinking about themselves that it's either be good, better to you guys or get picked up by the Russians. Did you see a change in their attitude toward you? No. Were they helpful toward you? They didn't even no. tell us any. They never talked no. to us on the march. No. We wouldn't understand them anyway unless somebody was German in the march. Otherwise, that's all they spoke was German. Would you say their attitude toward you was brutal? No, no, no. Indifferent? Just indifferent? No, they just marched with the guns. And that's yeah. All. Never said anything, did anything. Only if somebody tried to run away. And they were running away, a lot of them. So, in, it's a funny thing to say, but in a way you were a lot better off than you had been captured in the Pacific. Oh, well, sure. Okay, how were you rescued? <coughs> we ran into the bushes for a couple of days. Three of you ran away. Yeah, yeah. we stayed in the bushes for a couple of days to make sure everything was clear. Then we, were, <coughs> we saw a farmhouse with a barn, and we went in the barn, and we stayed there until we heard that the <coughs> British were in town. And <coughs> we, I went out to close the town and the other two stayed in the barn. And I saw the tanks and everything from the British 11th Armored Division. And I told them what, where we were and what happened. And they took me with the tanks and we rescued the other two fellows. Free? Yeah. Free. free. And did they get, feed you and oh, give yeah. you good clothes and take yeah. care of you? They took us to the town they let us go all around wherever we wanted to. There, we saw fellows in hotels looking to see what they could find. And then all that they put us on a train. And we went to Belgium. About when was this that you uh, you were finally picked up and freed? Yeah. <coughs> I had on the back certain dates on the back of the book what happened. So they wrote a Christmas feeling, you know, what were there on Christmas. See the drawing, this is our barrack, the room. Looking for that other page. I had all the, oh, here it is. Yeah, content. If you want to look at it, tells you, tells the base and everything, what happened. Let's see if I can hold this so it can be seen here. We'll look it over after the tape. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing to have. Yeah. Thank you. Where did you Where did you go? How did you get home? Oh, <coughs> in, well, in Belgium, they lost us, you know, for lice and all that. <laughs> after that, we went to a, a hotel, and we stayed overnight, <coughs> and we got on a train to go to La Havre, France, that was to take a boat home. We came home by boat. And the name of the boat was George Washington. A wooden boat. A wooden boat? Yeah. This wasn't the big liner? No. Was the war over by now, Frank? Was, was it after May of 45? <coughs> was the war over? Medicine, well, I think I have a here it is. I haven't been Two months we were on the march 60 days, so it was February, March, April. It would be about May. Yeah, okay. I, I meant to say the war in Europe, uh, not the war itself. You get home and you sail. Where did this wooden boat sail into? <coughs> New Jersey. Jersey? Yeah. You fight a whole war and you come home to New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they took us up in New Jersey and we went to a large auditorium and we had a general talk to us. And he told us that <coughs> we're going to go home for 60 days. I think I'm losing my voice. Have a drink. <laughs> we had a 
two months furlough. They gave us, and we were able to draw money because we were camped so long we built up money. Cause sure, you were rich. <laughs> it were, was home for you the Boston area? Yeah. So you got home for 60 days, June, July, the war in Japan, the Pacific, still wasn't over. No. Uh, was there any thought that you guys would be shipped out to go somewhere else? I don't think not prisoners of no. war. Okay. Never meant. You'd had enough. Yeah. So where did they uh, where did they put you? <coughs> From there, I went to Atlantic City when my furlough was up. Atlantic City, New Jersey. <coughs> we waited to be assigned. I found out that my pilot's wife had a sister station in the. She wasn't in the army. She worked for the army. <coughs> and I went to see her, and I told her. We talked. I said, I'd like to get me home to be stationed. She, she said, where would you like to go? I said, Army Base. Logan, <laughs> Logan Mayfield. Because we had guards there, and so I wanted to be assigned there, but she couldn't. Is this the wife of the man who was killed? No, 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 no. That's the wife of the pilot that they took off the plane that got sick. Ah, sick. okay. All right. <coughs> Lieutenant Teeter is his name. And you were sent to Logan Airport in Boston? No, no, no. they went. To, I mean, just a, they sent me to Bradley Field in Connecticut. All right. That was the closest they could Okay. Be. And there you were, and the war ended. <laughs> and I just stayed around the camp until I used to go home every Thursday, you know, hitchhike home, and come back by Monday. And I was in <coughs> the Air Force Supplies. I was to the head one day with all civilians with me, nobody else. I was the only service man in the supplies. They had to keep books a lot of what we had, what they gave out. And, and how about uh, discharge? How, when, when and where did you get out? <coughs> well, <coughs> if they came around, they asked, you know, who wants to get discharged or whatever. And we all put up our hands, we wanted to get discharged. So they shipped us to Westover Field. That's in Massachusetts. Yeah. And from there I got discharged. Having had quite an experience, yeah. don't let me forget to ask you this. Um, you did a lot, saw a lot, and you deserve to get some medals for this. Did you get any medals then? No. And what happened that you finally got your medals? <coughs> so, <coughs> some of the fellows that were my friends, they said, don't you have anything from being in the war? And I said, no, I never put in for it. About 11 years later, I said, ah, I'll see what they give me. And I put in for it. And this is, that's what they sent me, six of them. You got six medals. Yeah. And the, the, air medals, the air medal is in there. The cluster. Yeah. That's every five missions, you get a cluster. You know, goes on the ribbon. <coughs> Good conduct. Uh, POW medal. And then the different parts of countries. That European the theater, you've, you've yeah. got that one. Yeah. The American European theater and theater, the victory medal. The American medal. theater yeah. and the African. Silver yeah. on the back of you did all right for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us that when you got home, uh, I called you, my you, family. You've from got Belgium. the book. You called your family from Belgium. Yeah. They didn't let us all have a phone call. Oh. And they must have been thrilled to hear. Oh yeah. Had well, they knew you were in the camp that oh, you no. were alive. Because they used to write. But they wanted to know if you were Presently fine. Still. Yeah, that's good. When you got home back to the States and after the war, you've got that book. But did, I had the book the whole time. Did you otherwise sit and talk with your family about what you'd done, what you'd seen? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us that um, after this experience, what was the, the one thing that sticks in your mind in all your war experiences that you remember more than anything else? With my 
first mission, the one we went on, that was the thing that we always remember that. Our first mission over Cologne and the cold and everything. The others were routine, you know, just going, coming back, drop the bombs. Bailing out of a, a burning bomber is not routine. And I, I'm just surprised that that's not uppermost in your mind, but the way you tell it, going up that first time, that must be really something. Oh, yeah. So high I couldn't even see the ground. That's how they were little matchbox. How about a person? Is, is there a memorable character that you think about sometimes? A guy you served with? Somebody you met after the fact? Mm -hmm. we just, we're all the same and we just talk after the important. We've talked uh, now for just about an hour, Frank. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to put into this tape for your family or for historians that look at it years from now? <coughs> when I came back from the, from the prison camp, I was still in the army. And I came home and they were all waiting for me on the porch. And they all grabbed me to kiss me. Well, thank you, Frank. <laughs>